love. Thank you. Open your Bibles for scripture reading. Let's stand together as we read <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. We will be preaching this morning from verses 1 through verse number 11. But Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, we're going to read responsibly together. And let's begin. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our Heavenly Father, we ask now that your blessing would be upon the remainder of the service, and pray that you would anoint your messenger this morning. And Father, that you would use the Word of God in a powerful way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Philippians chapter 2 is written by the Apostle Paul because there were some conflicts. Um, I'm not preaching this message because there's any conflict. But as you know, people are people, and, and every day of our life, there's some kind of conflict, whether that's with family, whether that's with business, you know, worker, or boss, our fellow employees, uh, whether that's at school, whether that's our, your brothers, your sisters, every human relationship. And so, <clears throat> in verse 5, he writes this statement. He says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The verses before relate to that kind of a mind. In verse 2, he says, Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. And then after, the verses after verse 5 also relate to Jesus. And so we're going to pick this apart today, and we're going to look at how to be Christ-like-minded. A Christ-like mind. Been going through a, a series on the mind, and many, many different ways that we can use our mind to think. And I think that we, even as believers, um, waste a lot of our thoughts on, on issues and on things and our energies. We put it in ways that it should never be. Never was intended by God. Especially by the saints of God. And so first of all, we're going to look at <clears throat> a characteristic of a Christ-like mind, and that is to be a peacemaker. Jesus said, blessed are the the children of God, for they are blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Most of you know that I'm I'm in a, a position with two agencies, um, a chaplain with Woodenville Fire as well as with uh, King County Sheriff. There is is a saying or a um, a phrase that we use whenever we go on calls. And it is called this. It's called a ministry of presence. It's not just what we say, and often what we say does help. But it's just being there. And the idea of ministry of presence, when we go to a call, I had a call this week. Um, it was a tragedy. Could happen to any family. It was an accidental death. And it was, it was horrible. And, and I, I walked into the family, and of course, there's tears. They're numb. And every, pretty much every call we go on, whether that's with the county or with, or with the fire department, when we are called, it's almost never good. Once in a while, we will, we will follow the ambulance to the hospital, and God miraculously helps that individual to come back, and that's a wonderful thing. But 99% but of the time, they're a tragedy. This ministry of presence, what does it mean? It means that just by being there, we have a calming effect to the scene. Just our presence. 
Do you understand when you read the scriptures that that's exactly what Jesus was all about? People were, were crying and begging him for healing. He was able to bring calm and healing. Uh, the disciples, one of the most well-known stories everybody remembers is when they were on the Sea of Galilee and as they were going there was a storm that came up and the disciples were bailing water and they are scared out of their wits. They shake the Lord and say, Lord, save us, we perish. And all Jesus does is he stands up, says, peace be still, and it was calm. It was immediately a calm. That's the mindset that we need to have to be Christ-like. That no matter what is going on in the world, no matter what is going on in our family, no matter what is going on in our neighborhoods, that we can walk in to that situation and without even saying anything, and maybe sometimes what we say, we bring peace. Bring tranquility. Know what it says in verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. That's peace. Number two, to be Christ-like, we, we, we are to have that peaceful mindset, that calming effect to life. Secondly, if any comfort of love. Leave your finger there and go, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is a text that I, I have used for years with people that are grieving. Predominantly with believers, because believers are, are really the only ones that really grasp this fully. And most of you will be able to relate to this, who have lost a loved one or lost somebody dear to you. Beginning in verse number 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and I love this, and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able, now look at this, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. A Christ-like mind is being able to process and remember the comfort that we received from God Almighty, from the Lord Jesus, in whatever it was. And when we see a brother or sister who is hurting, a brother and sister who is grieving, we can sense it. And we go to them and we are able to speak comfort and say, you know, I may not understand everything, and I can't tell you I know how you feel because this is different than my situation. You need to be always careful. We, we're careful as chaplains. We, 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 are, we are told not to, to use that term, I understand, because you, you really don't. And that can be offensive to somebody when you put yourself in the position of understanding when you really don't even have a clue. So, but you can relate in the fact that you receive comfort in the, your most dire need or a, or a very critical time. What a blessing that you are able to be like Jesus and to bring comfort to those who need it. The more you are comforted, the more you're able to give comfort. The more you're like Christ, the more you're able to comfort. Jesus comforted all kinds of people. Now, you, you and I won't be able to raise people from the dead. There's a limitation. What a comfort uh, when, when Lazarus, his sisters, come and say, Lord, if you had been here, my, our brother had not died. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And they said, yeah, I know, I know you're gonna rise, we're all going to rise later, but right now our, our brother's dead. And he, he said, he's, he's going he's gonna to live. Jesus raised him and brought comfort. And, and that comfort 
came from something that moved him, and that was the tears of the people that he was watching. He watched Mary. Go to the text later. He was watching Mary weeping, and all of those around, and the Bible says he groaned. He was moved. You can't be comforting unless you're moved by other people's sorrow. So it's getting out of it's getting away from yourself and understanding that other people are hurting just like you and getting out of the mentality that you're the only one God's picking on you and that you this this is not right and this shouldn't have happened to me. No, there's nothing that is not common to man. Meaning everybody has every everybody experiences all the same things. It's all how we look at it. So if you get upset at God and you, and you have difficulty in dealing with, with the, the bad things that happen in life, you will, you will miss out on a Christ-like mind to be able to help somebody who's gone through the same thing that you have gone through or a similar thing that you've gone through. A Christ-like mind looks for the tears, the hurt, the brokenness of people and ministers to those folks in their time of need. Go back to our text, Philippians chapter 2. Another thing in a Christ-like mind is fellowship of the Spirit. What would you define as fellowship? A potluck? A meal? You know what most fellowship really is to be around? Go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Now we are Baptists and we love to eat. So, you know, potlucks, potlucks and talking and being, you know, visiting. We visit. We do a lot of that. But quite frankly, if you, if you look at where fellowship coincides in Scripture, it relates to fellowship of the Lord. Note what it says in verse... Number one, it says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Who is that? Jesus. Okay? For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And with his son, Jesus Christ. And so fellowship of the spirit is a spiritual fellowship. It's when we as believers can get together and we can talk about the Lord. We can, it's not just about the weather and it's not just about sports. It's not, and there's nothing wrong with those things in its place. But it's truly about what God's doing in your life. It, it's good to know how God is working. Uh, this morning I was blessed because we've been praying for Phyllis. And she told me that this, this past week that his, her husband in about a week is going to start a new position 9 to 6. It's answered prayer. And, and, and he needs the Lord. But you know what? He, he knows that this church is praying for him. That's That's huge. And so we had a little fellowship this morning talking about what God's doing in her life. That's wonderful. That's why we gather here. Uh, sharing a verse. Sharing an answer to prayer. Sharing a blessing of the week. Just, just being an encouragement. And the same outside these walls. Fellowshipping with other saints that we come in contact with. Have you ever... Have you, have, I'm sure you've had this experience. In your travels, you weren't expecting it, but you, you, you could tell that in your, as you were eating, or you could tell in conversation you were talking to somebody and you just knew that they were a believer. And so you introduced yourself. And you found out that there was something that you had greatly in common. His name is Jesus. And you began a conversation, and it was instant. You became friends, 
and you've probably never seen him again, but one day we'll walk the streets of gold with him because of faith. That's fellowship with the Spirit. It's wonderful to be able to have that, those conversations and have that, that intimacy because we may not agree on everything, but we can agree on one thing, that we know a Savior who died for us on a cross and shed His blood and, and gave His life for us and we put our faith and trust in Him and our life was changed forever and will always be changed because of Jesus. And so that fellowship... He uses this expression. He uses bows and mercies. To be Christ-like, we, we talk about the Lord. Jesus talked about the Lord all the time. Talked about His Father. He wanted His disciples to know the Father. He also, in a Christ-like mind, had bowels. That, that is a word for tender mercies. Tender mercies. He was gentle. His disciples when parents are bringing children to him, said, get these kids out of here. This is in, this is in the, the, the Greek, okay? Get these snotty-nosed kids out of here. They have no business being here. Don't you know the Lord is busy? And Jesus stopped them and he said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. And the Bible says he, he sat and he put them... And he, he blessed, he, he, he put them in the lap, he, he touched them, he loved them, and he, he, he was a blessing. Bless these children. Jesus was tender. Don't ever get crusty. Don't ever become cantankerous. Be, be a tender person. I remember in college... Um, I went Wednesday nights to, to a church and one of my professors, Pastor Ford, not four, Ford, I'll never forget him. Even in class when he would teach, he would never have a, he, he could never teach a class, he could never preach a sermon without tears. I never voiced it, but in my heart, I said, I want to be like that man. <laughs> there was no more of a caring person than Pastor Ford. Everybody knew it on campus. He was a tender man. Jesus was tender. The Bible says as he stood there and he watched Mary and he watched those that were crying over Lazarus, he stopped, and the shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept. It was tender. But he wasn't all, only tender, and should we, you know, and, and that doesn't mean that because you don't cry that you're not tender. Some people just, that's not them. I, 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 all, I have five kids, and one of my daughters is just, she's just not emotional. That's just who she is. Every once in a while, I mean, when she, when she cries, you know it's big, Okay? It's a, it's a huge deal, okay? Then I, I have another daughter, my, my oldest daughter, Stephanie, and you, you know her. She's like my grandmother. My, if, if somebody stepped on a bug, my grandmother would start crying. She cried for everything. And, and it just, it, it, she was just a very, very tender person. I have a, my, my oldest sister's that way. She's two years younger than me. I'm the oldest. And she's that way. She would, uh, she would cry if a bug, somebody stepped on a bug. She would, she would cry. I just, I love smashing the bugs, so I didn't, you know, so. We're tender. And then we're merciful. That word mercy relates to compassion. That is being able to love people and, and be, be gracious and kind to people that others won't necessarily get involved with. A couple weeks ago, we spoke on a loving mind. We talked about the Good Samaritan. And we read about two religious people in that story, right? How compassionate were they? One walked around the one side, one walked around the other side, 
Compassion was not even in the vocabulary. And then we had a man who, who was, would, to them, would have been the least likely to have any compassion whatsoever, a good Samaritan, not a Jewish man, and this man stopped and, and he took the man, nursed him back to health, brought him to an inn, told the innkeeper, here's some money, when I get back, if there's anything more, I'll take care of it. And he showed compassion. To be Christ-like, we're tender and we're to be compassionate. The next thing he says, he says in verse 2, he says, Fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded. Now note this, having the same love, being of one accord and one and of one mind. Now that's a, that's a tall order there. We will never love like Jesus. But we can sure try. Jesus loved the unlovable. Jesus loved his enemies. Uh, Jesus loved the thief on the cross. He loved the Zacchaeuses. He loved the leper. He loved the maimed, the halt, the blind, the poor. He loved who society threw away. He loved the <laughs> he loved the the harlot in Simon's house. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. That story, if you if you look, read the history of it, when when a Pharisee would invite people over, and the the way houses were set up, the outside had seats. And it was kind of an open, and, and, and so people in the community knew that Jesus was going to be there. And the public could come in, they couldn't come in in, in, the, in the inner circle of the, of the occasion, but they could be outside. And this lady came in to Simon's house, and everybody knew her, and Simon was appalled. And she stood close enough to Jesus that she began, she began to weep. And then she knelt down and wiped the tears, her tears that were on his feet with her hair. And Simon was appalled that this la he, he let this lady touch him and, in, and intended to embarrass Jesus and her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. The woman taken in adultery, he did the same thing. Uh, he, he, they, they said, the law says she should be stoned. And to paraphrase, he says, okay, well, then who's going to start? Pick up a stone. But he, he did something to precede it. He wrote down in the sand a bunch of words. We don't know what he wrote, but I, I think he listed sin. Because as God, he knew everything in their hearts. And the Bible says from the eldest to the youngest, they walked away. Not one of them picked up a stone. You see, it, it, one of the things that always, has always struck me with that story, and, and you'll hear me say this and reference this, is, is where was the man that was involved? Why, was it, why did they only bring the woman? I've always wondered if one of those that was there was involved. Okay, And so he was wanting to put it away or, or figure out a way that he could cover it up. I don't know. Who knows? But Jesus loved that, that woman and she, he said to her, Where are thine accusers? She says, There are none, Lord. And they said, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He loved her. He loved the woman at the well. Once he told her who he was, she went running back into town and said, Come here, a man which told me everything ever I did is not just the Christ. He loved people. To be Christ-like, we must love like Jesus. Then he, he fostered a mentality of one accord. That word, that, those words, one accord, you find in the early New Testament church in the book of Acts. It says they were all in one room, in the upper room, and they were 
praying and they were in one accord. That means they were united. They were all together in it. The Bible talks about striving together in the work of the Lord. So, they were one accord. They were one mind. Then it says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. We don't have to belabor that. We know what strife is. And we know what vainglory is. But note this. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. To do that, we must forget ourselves. Jesus taught this in, in Mark. He says, if any man will save his life, he'll lose it. But if any man will lose his life, the same shall save it. You say, what do you mean lose life and save life? Does that mean live or die? No, it's talking, he's talking spiritually here. What he's saying is if you're willing to lose yourself in people and minister to people unselfishly and forget yourself, you'll gain your life. But when, you can, when, you, when you're not willing to and you save yourself, and in, in other words, now your life is all about you, it's all about what you want, you lose it. There's no gain. There's no reward. Because life is all about you or me. That's not who Jesus was. He lost his life from the moment he came to earth. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came into his own and his own received him not. He made himself of no reputation, the Bible says, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give my life a ransom for many. What, is he, what was he saying? He's saying, I, I didn't come here because it's all about me. Does he deserve our praise? Every bit of it. Was he worthy of everything that we, could have give, that we could give him? Absolutely. And by the way, God will reward you and will exalt you for the things that you do later on, but that's what we are not to focus on. That's his business. That's not what we're to be about. To have a Christ-like mind, we forget ourselves and we lose our life in people. Note what he writes. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Now, verse 5, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is how Jesus thought every day. This is what, what motivated him every single encounter he had in life. This is how he called the disciples. This is how he healed this is how he touched people. Everywhere he went, in his Christ-like mind, he was always about others and not himself. There's an expression that is used here, very significant, in verse number 7. Verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What that means is, he, he knew he was God, and it wasn't robbery. In other words, he wasn't blaspheming to put himself on the level of God when he said, I and my Father are one. He that has seen me has seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? But he did not make an issue of that. But rather the most selfless act the Godhead decided and made was this next verse in verse 7 but made himself of no reputation, and it's all connected, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. That's what being humbled, or what, 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 that, that being in the form of God, thought it robbing it. And it says, but made himself of no reputation. That's what being made no reputation was. He became man. Hebrews says, he was made a little lower than the angels. There was God, 
angels, man. And Christ became a lower level creation for us. Selfless. He condescended. He could have, he could have made everybody when He came into the world bow and kiss His feet. And He could have made it all about worship and all about me. He didn't do that. Some people didn't know even who he was. He would come to towns and, and he would preach and they would reject him and he would say, if Tyre and Sidon, Sodom and Gomorrah, they heard what you've just heard, they would have already repented, repented in sackcloth and ashes. People didn't, they had no idea. The Father knew and Jesus knew, but that wasn't important to him. And by the way, that's not to be important to us. Names, titles, position, degrees. Who cares? Nobody could have had a higher degree than Jesus. Nobody more intelligent than the God of the universe. And yet, in his mind, his Christ-like selfless mind, he was willing to become man Thou madest me a body, Hebrew says, he was, given a, he was made a body that he could become flesh and die for us on a cross. We will never understand that. Never will ever be able to wrap our mind around that. But thank God he did. To have that kind of a mind, a Christ-like mind, we must be willing to be made in his likeness and to be a servant. His disciples got in an argument one day discussing who was the greatest. We've referenced this. And Jesus said, the greatest of you will be your servant. It's not who builds the biggest church. It's, it's not who makes the biggest splash. It's who behind the scenes lives for people and touches lives one by one. You see, we, we have a record of Gen Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John of Jesus. But what did John say? If all the books that could be written were to be written about Jesus, he says, I suppose that the world could not contain the things, all the things that he did. You know why? Because he touched people the disciples never saw. There were hundreds, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands or more, who when they came across Jesus, were moved because they could sense his selfless life and were immediately changed. There may be people one day when we get to heaven that you will touch who you will never know ever, got, ever were changed or ever were influenced by you. But if, if you have a Christ-like mind, they'll be moved. In verse 8 it says, Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Two things. First, having a Christ-like mind is, is to be humbled. You have to be willing to be humbled. Paul was humbled by a thorn in the flesh for three years because God knew he had a propensity for pride. We all have it in us. But it's not us that humbles us. It's not us thinking meanly of ourselves. But rather it's allowing God to do things in our life and make us not worry about what others think or worry about how we think 
but be, be, be glad that he's using us for what he did, or what, what he's chosen us to do. Paul says, I, I am what I am by the grace of God. Paul says, I'm the least of all the disciples. I'm the, chief, the, the chiefest of sinners. Paul never forgot who he was. We are never to forget what God has made us. And never, believe, never think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But to think soberly and to realize if it wasn't for Jesus, I'd be nothing. That's the mindset of Jesus. He could have purported a, an arrogance. He didn't. That's not who he is. That's not the God we serve. He enjoys our praise. But that's not, that's, that's not what he majors on. Verse 9, or verse 10, 8 says he was obedient. A Christ-like spirit is submissive to this book. Jesus said, I do all of those things which please my Father. Even our Lord himself was obedient to the word of the Father. The next two verses say, Wherefore God, because of this, because of that Christ-like mind, wherefore God hath also, also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. A Christ-like mind will allow you one day to be blessed with God's exaltation because of being selfless in your life. Our Father, we ask this morning, you would teach us to have a Christ-like mind. May we be like Jesus. May we love like Him. May we be peaceful like Him. May we be compassionate and tender. May we fellowship around the Spirit. May we enjoy being a servant. May we be humble. May we be obedient. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, we're going to stand. Maybe this morning you've got something you need to bring before the Lord. Maybe you're lost here today, you don't know Christ. My prayer is that you would give your heart to Christ today. Come let us show you from the Bible how you could be saved in this service this morning. Whatever your need, whatever your decision. Brian's going to sing.